going to switch now and just talk a little bit about uh, paleoecology and, 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 and paleoclimate, a little bit of theory, and then I'll give some examples. <clears throat> so uh, this is a, uh, actually an example from, as you can see, 30 years ago. This is Brighton, Utah. You guys have been to Jim's Cabin. This is a little higher in Brighton, in Brighton Utah. And this is a typical soil CO2 profile, and I just put it there because it's from one of my graduate students, Kip Solomon, uh, who's now a faculty member in our department. And uh, we measured this CO2 concentration profile. And it's a typical sort of profile that illustrates a bunch of really important stuff. One thing that's important that it illustrates is you go down in the soil, CO2 gets higher. Okay? So this is always true unless you're in some transient, some peculiar transient situation, okay? like really deep um, unsaturated zones as you switch from summer to winter that upper boundary you may be in the summer you're pushing soil too deep in and in the winter you may degas the soil and then when you start up again in the summer you may, you may have to refill the reservoir because the soil has been degassing for, for several months uh, but this is kind of a typical upper profile so we're down to a meter and we go from you know, 300 and whatever it was, 60 ppm at the time, to nearly 10,000 ppm. Very typical profile. CO2 goes up as you go down the soil. Other important features are the really steep gradient is way, way up at the top of the soil. The steepest gradient is in the upper one centimeter. The second steepest is in the, from one to two centimeters, and so on. So this gradient flattens out and eventually uh, essentially becomes flat. <clears throat> That's your lower boundary condition, which may be groundwater table. Uh, and uh, and we, our upper boundary condition is the concentration of atmospheric CO2. Okay? So we can look at diffusion of gases, of, 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 of gases in soils. And uh, so remember, I said we were going to see this equation many times. Uh, so this is our concentration, diffusion coefficient. I've left off the advection term, the W term. That's gone to zero. Uh, this is our chemical reaction terms. So this is just a production term. And we've said here this production term can be a function of depth. And then I've put in a decay constant in case you're working with carbon-14. Okay, So then you can, and the nice thing with carbon-14 is, is you can you have two isotopes as tracers. Your carbon-13 is an isotope tracer. Carbon-14 is an isotope tracer. And uh, to actually solve the, 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 to solve the equation explicitly, you need boundary conditions. So boundary conditions is that par C, uh, uh, the, 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 the concentration, in this case, the ratio of the concentrations uh, with respect to time does not change. So that that's our steady state situation. If you're not going to have steady state, well, then you have to do all of this numerically. And another really useful boundary condition is that the concentration at depth, the gradient at depth goes to zero. That mean, and what that means is it's a no flux lower boundary. Okay, that's what, if that gradient goes to zero, nothing is being lost. Okay, so it's kind of remember, important to remember when you work on these, what these boundary conditions physically mean. Uh, uh, if par C, par Z goes to zero, that means nothing is moving across that boundary. So it's an impermeable layer. Okay? And if things are moving through that boundary, then it's not zero, and you need to deal with that. Now, it might be so low that you say, well, I can ignore it. But it's just important to remember what those boundary conditions actually mean. So we can solve all of this stuff, and it looks like just a big mess, and it's just algebra. And so you, you guys can all do algebra. <clears throat> and what's really important in the end is the this is what I mentioned in the first lecture, is the, uh, the uh, Stefan Maxwell equation for binary diffusion is D of alpha mole alpha uh, uh, diffusing in B, so alpha is our stuff of interest. In this case, CO2, 
either la you know, labeled CO2, carbon-12 CO2 or carbon-13 CO2, diffusing in soil air, which is mostly nitrogen. So you have a bunch of these funny little terms, and uh, a bunch of these funny little terms, like uh, sigma alpha beta is a collision diameter. Okay, that's not a function of, of uh, oh, that, that's constant for CO2, C12 CO2 or C13 CO2. The molecules don't know which isotope is labeled in terms of the diameter of them. Uh, and so all of these terms and the KT and the pi all cancel out for carbon-12 versus carbon-13. And so that we ended up with this equation describing the diffusion coefficient for carbon-12 CO2 compared to 13 CO2 ends up being this little bit of a mess. And it's 1.0044, which is a tiny, tiny number, but for isotopes, that's 4.4 per mil. So that's where this magic 4.4 per mil comes from that we've been talking about in a variety of contexts in this class. <clears throat> All right, so what this predicts, there's some interesting predictions here. And so this predicts that soil CO2 and soil respired CO2 have different delta C13 values. And this has always been a confusing thing to a lot of people. Uh, and so it, what it says is that soil CO2 is always at least 4.4 per mil greater isotope value than soil respired CO2. And that means that not all soil CO2 is the same thing. Okay, so they're, they're different things. And this gets into how you measure things. So we have on this figure now, um, we have what I think of a carpool lane and a regular lane on a freeway. And so what is the ratio of red to blue? What's the ratio of red to blue? One to six. One to six. Okay, how did you measure it? Counted. You counted. Okay, you took a photograph and you counted it. Let's imagine that you were a traffic observer and you were standing on a bridge right here. And these guys are going 60 miles an hour. These guys are going 10 miles an hour. And you counted every vehicle that went underneath you. What would the ratio that went underneath you be? One to six. It'd be one to one. Okay, these guys are going much faster than all of these guys. Okay. So one of those, so what's the difference in these? One is a flux and one is a concentration, okay? It's easy to measure concentrations, really easy to measure concentrations. This happens all the time in geochemistry. We see a concentration and we say, oh wow, that's a really big problem because that's really high concentration. And then, but is it really important? We need to know the flux. How important is it to the whole system? My first job was, at a place called Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And I was part of a group to work on nuclear waste disposal that had been, let's just say, carelessly disposed of. So we had these hot spots that had been previously identified because they flew around with helicopters and, ooh, this is radioactive, that's radioactive. So we had these radioactive hot spots. And yes, these are important, but what we found out is the really important flux, which is the stuff getting into the river and out of the system, was actually coming from a couple of drainage pipes that had been misconnected about 40 years, no, not 40, 30 years previously. <laughs> and nobody had ever checked because they weren't supposed to be radioactive, so nobody thought they were radioactive. And we had this huge flux of low concentration. Okay, so the flux is, is what we need to know. So what's the difference in our two measurements that we, that we have? for your two answers. Five, six. Well, you know, what's the difference in the way that you evaluated your answer? One, you basically took a photograph. Okay, and one, you integrated over time. So now when we're collecting soil CO2, how are we gonna collect it? And what are we gonna call it? So if we collect an instantaneous volume of soil CO2, we might get one answer. If we collected all of the CO2 over, say, an hour that actually passes through an interface, we might get a different answer. Okay. 
Okay? So how you collect your sample design for collecting things is extraordinarily important in what you're doing. And you kind of need to know, well, what are the things that can screw up your answer? That was part of that little data sheet that we gave you to think about early on, is what are the things that can go wrong with your, 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 your problem? And so um, in, in, if you go back to the study of, of certainly of soil CO2, you'll find that a lot of you know, people were collecting things in completely different ways and calling them the same thing, giving them the same name, even though they represented these two different things. Yeah. So you're saying that if you measure the flux of respiration CO2 coming off the soil, that isotope ratio value would probably equal the value of the respiration yes. from the microbial decomposition yeah. as opposed to the concentration of pores. Yeah. Yes. So and you're taking your discussion and moving to that specific yeah. example. And if you do this on Keeling plots, you'll find you get two different intercepts for the two different collection methods. And they should be four and a half per mil different. They're, they're four and a half per mil different. Yeah. So, so, so yes, very different. You have to know what it is that you are measuring when you're collecting your sample. This is just a bunch of stuff that might be useful in the future sometime. Uh, uh, but there's some really cool things here. We can, um, we can approximate, make a couple of approximations and we can see how important they are. But here's the delta value for soil CO2. And it turns out, here's your, this is the respired delta value, say minus 27 for a C3 dominated system. This is the concentration of of, of CO2 in air divided by the concentration in soil, the delta value for the air, delta value for the, um, for the um, respired thing. And that end up, you know, there ends up being tacked on this four and a half per mil uh, enrichment. So that means no matter what your delta C13 of your respired CO2, of your, the respired value, the soil CO2 will always be at least 4.4 per mil greater. And it could be even much greater. It could be 10 per mil greater, depending where you are in the profile. <clears throat> and so the elegance of this equation is we can combine a bunch of things, and it turns out we could even use this to calculate, I mean, what if you wanted to know what the, the isotope value of the atmosphere, or the, the concentration of the atmosphere was? You need to know that this is actually the concentration of soil CO2 at some depth. And if you know the delta value of the soil CO2 and the production value, you can actually calculate the atmospheric value. And you might say, well, that's really a dumb way to calculate the atmospheric value. But it turns out that you know, 8 million years ago, it was really hard to measure soil CO2. We didn't have things to measure it. OK. So. Uh, Let's look at, at some systems. Um, here's the typical chemical reaction. CO, calcium carbonate plus water plus CO2 goes to calcium ion plus bicarbonate. <clears throat> and this is a system where it's, we're buffered by atmospheric CO2. Now, sometimes you will occasionally see this in a textbook and then your, your head should just cringe. And you will see that half of the CO2, in fact, this is in Pete Birkeland's recent revision of his book. <laughs> yeah, look at what happened. She just we almost. Didn't review it. Yeah, we didn't review it. If half of the CO, people say, well, half the CO2 comes from the rock, because look, we have two CO2s. One came from the air, one came from the carbonate. Therefore, half is coming from the rock. Then, and that's true in an individual reaction, but this isotope exchange reaction, CO2 and bicarbonate, this reaction happens so fast, okay, and there's so much of this CO2 that this label is all of this stuff, and that label is lost, okay? Okay, so this is a very, very fast 
equilibrium exchange reaction. So if we have a, then this is essentially a huge reservoir of this, and we're doing a tiny little bit of this, okay? And you could easily do that, say, how much calcium carbonate can you dissolve in a year in a soil? And we could say, like I would say to you if you were on a PhD qualifying exam, I'd say, okay, how much, how much limestone can you dissolve in a year of Salt Lake City rain? And you could say, and I could also say, well, how much CO2 is, is, is coming through that soil? Well, you'll see that the CO2, the biological CO2 is 1,000 or 10,000. It's you know, four or five orders of magnitude higher than the, than the rock contribution. So for isotope space, for isotope space, we need to consider those, the ratios of the flux of those. Okay, so we just have to worry about simple equations. Um, and uh, calcium carbonate formation, we can do it by soil degassing. We can change the ion activity to evapotranspiration or direct evaporation. We could change the ion activity by freezing. We have retrograde solubility, a bunch of different mechanisms. <clears throat> if we look at a soil, this is just a typical soil that we collected many, many years ago. Uh, and we said, well, what are, the, what are the depth profiles? Here's the depth profile for delta O18. So this is a soil deposited on the land, uh, 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 formed in a parent material that was deposited on the landscape at the last glacial maximum. So this has had only one major climate episode to form, the Holocene. And this is what the carbonate looks like. What's really important is there's no carbonate here above 40 centimeters. And we find in most places in the Western US and the world where you get soil carbonate, the actual, the, the, there's a leach zone of 20, 30, 40 centimeters, okay? There's only a few rare places in the world where you actually get soil carbonate precipitated at the soil area interface, okay? So that's a, so there's usually this leach zone and then these values are constant, okay? So that's, so it's, it's essentially constant and we might expect that. Here's the, the predicted isotope ratio of Calcium or of, of soil CO2 is a function of depth for different soil respiration rates. So our input value is always minus 27. The surface value is fixed. And so what's significant is that all of these, any, for any soil respiration rate, so this would be, you know, my hometown in Iowa in the summer, okay? Uh, so we get this very steep gradients in the very upper part of the soil and what's certainly convenient if you're somebody like me and tries to use soil carbonate as a paleo indicator is these are all flat. The isotope ratio is flat at depth. It may change seasonally, but, but at any one time it's, it's fairly fat, flat. And here you see we're putting in minus 28 per mil and our most negative value is minus 23 per mil. That's that four and a half per mil thing. So, uh, Isocamp 3 invented something called dog bones, okay? Uh, we were trying to uh, measure soil CO2 in, I think, week number two. And so the dog, one of the mass spectrometers that you haven't been introduced to is over in the next building in my lab. It's called Big Dog. And so a dog bone is something you feed to a big dog. And so the dog bones are just uh, copper uh, tubes that, we, that had a hole in the bottom uh, that we could pound into the ground and figure out a way not to get them plugged with soil, which is the hard part, and then collect CO2 at depth. Or actually, we were actually collected with a syringe. We actually would just put a needle into the soil and collect CO2 in gas tight syringes. So this is the, the first good soil CO2 profile that had detail up in the upper, uh, actually five, five to 10 centimeter uh, uh, depths. Yeah, so this is depth. So we were at, at basically one centimeter. We were actually measuring soil CO2. So this is a, 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 an isocamp invention. Uh, here's the delta C13 with depth. Okay. And it was done 25th of September. We weren't doing isocamp that late, but 
we went, couldn't get it to work right, and then, then Renata Gavauer and I decided that we would try to get it ready for ISOCAMP 4 <laughs> for the next year. <clears throat> so that's why, so, so, so we played around after the thing was over. Here's, oh look, here's the uh, really important figure. So delta C13 plus all of it. So this is the equation I just gave you recently, but, but, but cast just as a, as a regression line. There's our air samples, and here's our soil CO2 values. We get an intersect of, intersection of minus 20.4. So uh, our, soil, uh, our soil organic matter should be about minus 25 per mil. So it should be 4 per mil down here. So Dave's question earlier, if we measured soil respired CO2, we should get a line that would look like this. Okay, so depending on what you're collecting, you get different answers. So our theoretical value is minus 24.7 per mil. And, uh, oh, I think that we, can, we, we measured a value about minus uh, 20, 25 per mil. Okay, so this is just recombining those equations uh, and, and, and taking, here's our regression line. Okay, our intercept is this. Okay, and the slope is this. Y is equal to B plus MX. Um, this is an elegant, uh, uh, one of my first graduate students was Jay Quaid, and he was always designs elegant field experiments, and, and, and he went very much out of his way to find a soil where we could get soil carbonate that formed in the last, in this case, 7,000 years because the parent material was deposited 7,000 years ago, and we got soil carbonate all the way to the surface, and here's the isotope profile. So this is the car soil carbonate, but it's preserving the delta C13 value of the soil CO2. Just a beautiful experiment. Uh, Dan Breaker, a couple years ago, published another paper where more of these soils with carbonates precipitated to the surface were found. And we see in all of these, we get this really steep gradient up here in the upper 10 centimeters. And that means this is a really complicated area that, that you, you, you really need to know soil depth. Unfortunately, nature, usually it's mean to us, but this is one of the cases where it's been kind to us. Soils with carbonates precipitated in the upper 20 or 30 centimeters where the gradient is are very difficult to find, okay? So nature, for once, said, okay, I know you guys aren't smart enough to do this. Make it easy. That's why I work on it. Uh, Dan Breaker did another nice thing in this study. He's monitored soil CO2, temperature, delta C13. Uh, he didn't, he didn't it's, it's, a, it's a fairly coarse data set. I've got a student, Tyler Huth, who's doing a similar data set now, only he's making these measurements every 15 minutes. Um, except he can't get soil CO2 that often. I mean, the, the delta C13 that often. We've got soil profiles being measured every 15 minutes uh, from some soils um, out here in Utah. What's important here, here's the mean annual precipitation. It gets wet in this region in the spring. Uh, and here's another important thing. Soil CO2 hits a maximum in the growing season, not a surprise, and then it PCO2 goes down. This would, this would be a good time for um, carbonate precipitation. This is the maximum soil temperatures. Okay, This is mean annual temperatures in here. Uh, um, so that's a good time for soil carbonate formation. So one of the nice things is that these features often... Oh, and this is also when the soils are degassing because it's the growing season. Or not not degassing, but, but, but the... the the, the plants are, are taking out water and leaving behind calcium. So these three things tend to come, in many soils, come together. Temperature, preferred temperature, preferred degassing, uh, and, and dewatering by the plants. 